All right, I'm going to do a little video on um, the pressure loops um, right here. Basically, just uh, the cycle of the heart um, as it's beating. And then if there are different increases in certain things, such as uh, increased preload, increased afterload, and increased tractility, and how, um, how the heart's going to adapt to those, okay? So over here is just our reference guide, pretty much. So we have four stages. Uh, one would be refilling. Two is your isometric contraction. Three is your ejection. And four is your relaxation. So you can kind of see right here that I have them labeled um, according to the numbers, okay? So one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to one, okay? So this is just a reference guide as we um, go over these three loops that are right behind me, okay? So we're gonna start with the loops and just um, these words over here on the uh, far right are just um, words that I'm going to be referencing to so I just kind of left them up there so you can see so SV would be our stroke volume um, venous turn, return would be how much blood is returned to the heart um, EDV is your end diastolic volume um, which you can also look as um, preload it's uh, the amount of blood um, in the ventricles before it's going to be ejected so you can say um, when the heart's relaxed, how much blood is left in the ventricles, that's your um, EDV. Um, your ESV is your end systolic volume. It's pretty much how much blood is left in the ventricles after it's ejected. So um, that's what that is. And then your filling time would be how, um, it's just like it says, how long the heart has time to fill before it contracts and ejects and sends it through the pulmonary and um, systemic circuits and then back to the heart, okay? So, first scenario that we have is an increased preload, okay? Now again, preload is how much blood is in the um, left ventricle um, prior to being ejected. And I say left ventricle because that's pretty much the last stop for the blood before it gets pumped into the systemic circuit because it's already came back through the pulmonary circuit, it's dropped through the left atria, and then down into the left ventricle, and it's getting ready to uh, be pumped out into the body, okay? So, let me get my right marker here. So, our first scenario is going to be an increased preload, okay? And the dotted lines just shows you the changes in everything, okay? So, as I'm talking, feel free to reference behind me, okay? So, if we have an increased preload, so if we have an increased amount of blood that we have in our left ventricle, what do you think that it's going to do to the heart? Well, what it's going to do is, one, it's going to increase our um, filling time, or if you want to call it venous return, okay? It's going to increase our venous return because we're getting more blood into the left ventricle. It's filling with more blood. So that means that we have to have more blood coming back to the heart, okay? That's our venous return, all right? And you can also look at that as kind of increasing our filling time, okay? Right at the bottom. Now, if we have an increased preload, we know that there is a lot of blood in our left ventricle getting ready to be pumped out. So what that's going to do is increase our stroke volume. Our stroke volume is how much blood can be pumped out per heartbeat. So if we increase our preload, the amount of blood that we have in our left ventricle before it's ejected, we have to pump out more. That's going to increase our stroke volume, okay? So increase your preload, you increase how much blood is returned to the heart, you increase your filling time because that amount of blood is getting greater, so we have to have a longer time for it to fill, and then we pump out more. We get more, we pump out more. All right, that's the relationship. I think that's the Frank, um, Frank Starling, what is it, mechanism? I'm not too sure about that, but it sounded good. All right, so next, B, we have an increased afterload. Now our afterload um, is the amount of pressure that the heart has to 
work against after it's ejected. So let me just draw a little, uh, let me draw a heart. We have our left ventricle, okay, follow me here. We have our aorta coming up. It likes to branch off every which way. And then we're coming down, okay? This is our aorta, all right? So the blood, as we know, likes to shoot up, okay? And it follows its route. It goes all over the place, all right? Now, the pressure slash blood, however you want to look at it, that gets built up right here is our afterload. That's what our afterload is. So if you can imagine that there is a valve right here for the blood, for the blood to go through, the pressure that the heart has to work against this valve, you can call it your afterload, okay? And I'm going to erase that. So, if we increase our afterload, it's going to decrease. It's going to decrease our filling time. Okay. So, if we increase our afterload. So, if we increase the pressure, the heart has to work harder. So it pumps less because it can't, it can't work against that pressure that's built up. So if our heart has to work harder, it's also going to decrease our stroke volume because since we have that build, build up pressure right before that the blood goes through the, uh, to the body, it can't pump as much blood through. So it's, it's like quicker pumps but less blood, okay? And that's why you have a decrease in your filling time is because it's, it's working harder to do, um, to do more. So when what we want is for the heart to, to throw more blood out and, and beat slower. So it's kind of like being more efficient. So um, basically the bottom line is if you increase the pressure right before all the blood needs to go to the body, you're going to decrease your stroke volume because the blood that needs to be pumped out of the heart can't overcome that pressure right before it goes into the body, okay? And for that increased pressure, and we have quicker pumps, we have um, a decrease in our filling time, so our filling time is, is greater, okay? It's not a long period, all right? So, also, if we have... If we have an increased afterload, it's going to increase our ESV, okay? So remember, our ESV was our end um, systolic volume, which is how much blood is left in the left ventricle after it's ejected, okay? So I'll even draw it again. So same concept, aorta, left ventricle, all right? The blood's getting pumped out, but remember, we have this increased preload. We have this pressure that the heart has to work against. So the amount of blood that gets ejected is going to be less. So as that pressure is building up, that should have been a V, the amount of blood that is left in the left ventricle increases, okay? Now, for the last one, our increased contractility, and that's pretty much just how, um, how hard the... Um, Ventricles want to contract and eject more blood, so basically your heart's just working um, and um, increasing strength of its ejection, okay? So, if we have an increase in our contractility, if we have an increase on how hard that we want to eject the blood out of the heart, it's 
going to increase our stroke volume because we have a strong contractility or strong, um, strong uh, strength of our heart to pump the blood out, okay? So that's going to increase our stroke volume. Now, if we also have an increased contractility, that's also going to mean that we increase our filling time. Since we have, since our ventricles are strong, we have a strong grip on that blood. This is how I'm going I'm to refer to it. If we have a strong grip on that blood and we're ready to shoot it out, that's our increased contractility, we're going to increase our stroke volume. We're going to increase the amount of blood that we pump out. And since we increase the amount of blood that we um, pump out, all that blood that has to come back, we're going to have a longer time to refill. So we can get that, that amount of blood again and keep pumping and keep pumping and keep pumping. That is why when, train, when you have trained versus untrained people, their stroke volumes are greater in trained people because they have a stronger contraction. They have that ability to pump more blood out, all right? And so usually in athletes, if you have an increase in stroke volume, you have a lower heart rate because the heart doesn't have to work as hard versus untrained. So an untrained person, the stroke volume and um, their heart rate will pretty much be even during exercise, whereas um, an athlete, they train their body, the, the heart doesn't have to work as hard, but it does more, you know, so it's more efficient. So that's pretty much it. I think that's pretty good. So um, there you go.